All right. Yeah, testing everything out, making sure everything's working just fine. Those of you that are watching this after the fact, this will be my, uh, I think it's fourth or fifth review session. This will be over um, the second half of unit three. This ends up being, a lot of my students consider this to be one of the harder parts of the course. Personal opinion, I think it is also one of the harder things in the course. And that is the long run aggregate supply. Uh, we're going to talk about the line, what it means. We're going to talk about uh, some things that can change it. And we're going to talk primarily about the hard part of it is, is what's referred to as the long run self adjustment process. The idea that if the economy is self correcting in the long run, what does that mean from a problem standpoint? When I change something on my aggregate demand supply graph, what happens in the long run eventually? And then also we're going to hit fiscal policy just for the sake of it, because that's also in unit three and I might as well. So the big focus on today will be long aggregate supply, but we'll hit fiscal policy at the end of it. Uh, again, the layout of this video is going to be probably first 30 minutes, me just reviewing each of the topics, trying to fly through them. Again, this is not like me hitting every detail of every one of these topics, but I'm going to give you enough to hopefully reactivate your memory and get you back to where you need to be that you can answer a bunch of questions over them. Um, so go back to your notes for like the nitty gritty details, but I can give you the nice overview of these topics that'll help you sort of be good on it again. Uh, and then the last 30 minutes, I'm going to go through some practice problems. I got a handful of multiple choice questions and one FRQ that I'm going to try and answer like completely cleanly and as accurately as I can. This again might be kind of, I'll say that this one, I don't plan on being a shorter video. It could be just because the AP classroom stuff that I grabbed is a little shorter only because I didn't want to grab an FRQ that hits things that we haven't covered yet. If you're hearing tearing, it's because there is a, I don't, a little like cushion that I'm sitting on that has Velcro, so it might just tear. Uh, but yeah, that's the game plan here. We're gonna hit these main topics and you'll see them on the screen in a second when I pull up the virtual whiteboard. And let me make sure that my channel is working properly and that my stuff is streaming properly and I think we'll be good. Yes, it is up. Let me go pull it up. Yeah, audio is working. Cool. Everything sounds good on my end. Perfect. All right. So, yeah, we'll get started here in a couple minutes. Again, the video will be over the long run aggregate supply curve, the long run self adjustment process, as well as fiscal policy. Uh, that'll be the big main focus for today. Uh, Archer is joining me today. He is a good boy. He is right there. Hello, Archer. Say hi to the camera. Be a good boy or whatever you're doing. Just staring at it. Great. Love it. Love to see it. Good dog. Yes, I'll fetch you. Good boy. Yeah, so we're going to start here in a couple minutes. I'm trying to think of anything else that I should mention. Uh, AP exam. We are looking at, like, how long now? Like, four weeks? About a little... No, five weeks. Five weeks till the AP exam. My brain's not working. Yeah, five weeks till the AP exam. Uh, if you're pacing with me, we will finish all of the content review uh, before your other AP exam start. So we'll do, like, unit four four next week, five the week after, six the week after, and then it's AP exam week, and I don't want to be reviewing content like for the first time with you guys in that week, so I'll be doing a bunch of like summation stuff, like, okay, here are questions that hit the gambit, that hit kind of everything in the course, let's go through those. So it'll be like more like cumulative style questions and long FRQs and things like that on that last week, in case you're wondering. Uh, and then we're going to do that Super Saturday, the Saturday before the AP exam. And the morning of the AP exam, we'll be doing a live stream cram session. Oh, that's stuff. Did you go ahead and hit the desk? Yeah, I did. Okay. So, yeah, we'll get started here in a second. Let me make sure that everything's working on this part also. Yeah, that looks okay. Here's sort of your list of things that we're covering today in the video. Yep, that should just about cover it. All right, I can make that a little bit bigger, actually. There we go. And no, I need that room to draw. Okay. All right, uh, 4.30 on my clock, so let's get started. Uh, hello, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever, whatever you're watching this video. Uh, this is the AP Macro Review session, and this is the one that's gonna be over one of the harder things in the entire course, the long run aggregate supply curve the long run self adjustment and fiscal policy, both expansionary and contractionary fiscal policy, discretionary, non-discretionary fiscal policy, all of it. 
Again, the layout of the video is going to be 30 minutes of me going through the content and then hopefully 30 minutes of me going through review questions. I might The questions themselves might only take me about 15 to 20 minutes this time because I didn't have as many of them that I felt comfortable pulling uh, since we haven't reviewed stuff later in units yet. Uh, but yeah, we're going to go through a bunch of these things, try to explain them best I can, try to let's say fly through them, but this is a review, so you should have more detailed notes over each of these topics. This isn't teaching it for the first time, this is refreshing you on some stuff. All right, so let's get started. That snap might have been really loud, it's right next to the mic, I'm sorry. All right, so second half of unit three. Uh, last video we hit on the short run aggregate demand and aggregate supply stuff. That just gave us the idea of like, hey, an economy, we've got an economy, it's doing good, let's draw it, this graph's gonna look like garbage, I bet. Oh, no, that worked okay. So we got my little GDP and my price level. Oh, no, don't do that. There we go. We've got my short run aggregate supply right here, and we got my aggregate demand. Okay, so short run versus long run as concepts. So the short run is the immediate future, is how I always phrase it for kids. If a thing happens, what it, when they're asking what happens in the short run, is they're asking what happens next. Like, what is the next thing sequentially to happen? If you improve productivity immediately, aggregate supply should increase. Short run aggregate supply should increase because right now, if we're more productive, we could produce more, and aggregate supply measures that. The long run, technical definition is going to sound kind of weird for a lot of you guys, but I'll say it anyway. The long run is however long it takes for all of your inputs price to change. However long you can go when, when all of your prices change. So like, what I mean by that is stuff like, you know, imagine you at your job, you probably don't get pay raises very often, maybe once a... Uh, six months, maybe once a year, like it's not consistently common, right? Well, your labor is one of the inputs, one of the things used to produce products. So that means the long run for the company would be however long they go until they have to start paying you more. Like when they hit that benchmark of paying you more, they are now reached the long run. They are out of the short run and in the long run because now they have to adjust things. They have to sort of track what's going on, adjust it and make it happen. Now, what that means for the graph. So the short run aggregate supply is built on business's ability to do things right now. The long run aggregate supply is business's ability to do things eventually. So what that's gonna to refer to. The basic idea, the sort of conceit of the long aggregate supply curve is that it is eventually businesses should be able to utilize all of their resources because the price of those resources can change right in the long run the prices could go up they could go down you could pay your workers more you could pay your workers less so the long aggregate supply curve is sort of best thought of as your ideal level of production if you have these certain amount of resources you currently have if you're using all of them in a sustainable like doable way you'd be making this amount of the good. It wouldn't matter what the price is because in the long run, the prices can go up and down, they can change. Prices aren't sticky, they're fully flexible in the long run. So you get a different looking supply curve, one that is typically drawn like this, a vertical line, the long run aggregate supply curve. And again, what it's telling me is I don't tend to think of this line as a different supply curve because it gets tricky when you do that. What I tend to think of it all as is a benchmark, an indicator of my current economic performance. That, that vertical line is drawn at a specific spot. Whatever this X value is, is full employment. It is my level of production at full employment. If my economy is crushing it, then I would be at my LRAS. So my drawing that I have here is an economy that is effectively crushing it. They are what is considered at full employment because SRAS, AD, and LRAS are all intersecting in the same spot. The translation there is that where SRAS and AD meet, that equilibrium is where your economy's production is currently. Where your LRAS is, where the long aggregate supply is drawn, is where your level of production should be. 
if you were doing everything properly, right? If you didn't have to worry about the prices, if the businesses just had the resources they had, regardless of the price, they would be at this amount of productivity. They'd be at this amount of GDP. They'd be making this amount worth of stuff. So you might see something called a recessionary or an inflationary gap. These are also referred to, so be aware of this students, uh, as positive and negative output gaps. That's a new way of phrasing it that the AP exam is kind of lagging. I've, it makes sense for the inflation part of it because inflationary gaps sometimes don't have to have inflation happening. It's just assumed that that is happening. But I don't like it for the recessionary gap. So what these are referring to, and I'll draw you one of them first, is that, oh, that's a terrible demand curve. Let's do that. There we go. There we go. There's also a supply curve. What those are referring to, the gaps, is referring to a situation in which your current equilibrium, where I'm at right now, so again, where these two lines are, so this spot right here, when that is not at full employment, when that spot is not where LRAS is. So if my LRAS is over here, to the right of my equilibrium, then I am in what's called a recessionary gap, and here's how that works. My current level of production is here. It is where SRAS and AD meet, because short run is like immediate future, it's like right now. So that dotted line little area tells me my GDP right now, my GDP at equilibrium. LRAS, again, is telling me how much my production should be. It is GDP at full employment. It is, again, if you're crushing it, if you're doing everything properly, you would be right there. This, YE, is less than YF, right? Whatever numbers are here, how x-axes work, is that whatever number is here is less than whatever number is here. Say my current GDP is 500 billion and my full employment level of production is 700 billion. That means I'm 200 billion below where I'm supposed to be. That's why it's a recessionary gap because recessions appear to time where your GDP is too low. Oh, too low in reference to what, if you're asking, it's too low in reference to full employment. So you're like, wait, what do you mean if like my GDP is not where it's supposed to be? It's like where it's supposed to be is here at YF. Currently, it's not. That's bad. So if it's below it, behind it, is how I also phrase that, is that well, I'm in a recessionary gap. To be clear, LRAS didn't move. It stayed the same. My full employment level of output was the same, but my current level of output is lower. So like when I'm drawing this, I'm not like imagining that I started LRAS here and shifted it to the right. No, I'm imagining that LRAS is here and that my current economic situation is behind where it's supposed to be. The inflationary gap would just be in, in the opposite spot. Oh my God, no. Dang it, I did this out of order. Ugh, fine. All right. So inflationary gap would be like that. The curve wouldn't be that curvy, but we'll go with it. Because that'd be my current level of production right there is ahead of YF. This is also called a positive output gap because it means the output gap, the gap in output in GDP is positive. But like this gap is actually like positive. We, we are producing more than we should be. Not the end of the world, but a lot of the time that would cause inflation, which not great, but not as bad as a recession. So those are my gaps. So again, LRAS is a reference point. It gives you context for the economy. When questions in an AP exam, especially FRQs, say things like, assume an economy starting in a recession. Assume an economy starting in an inflationary period. Assume an economy starting in a negative or a positive output gap. What they're telling you is where to put LRAS in reference to your equilibrium. Positive output gap, my LRAS is to the left of my equilibrium. Negative output gap, it would be to my right. Okay, sorry, it's spring now, so allergies are happening, and my dog is shedding, so he's not helping. You're not helping, Arch. He's behind me. Okay. The long run self adjustment. This is the thing that sucks. I think that is okay, it's just kind of the thing you're assuming, but it's not terrible. The long run self adjustments where people tend to be like, uh, I don't like this that much, Mr. McRitchie. It's like, yeah, I don't either. Okay, so built on two things. What we're about to explain to you is built on two things. So you got to take these two things just sort of as facts. In the long run, wages and prices are fully flexible. 
just means that given enough time, prices can go up and down, so can wages, right? Makes sense, because again, I don't get a pay raise all the time, but I do eventually get pay raises. So given enough time, that will eventually happen. So wages and prices fully flexible in the long run. Second thing, in the long run, and this is an assumption, not always true in the real world, but we're going to treat it as true for the class. The economy is self-correcting. What is meant by that is something kind of simple. Uh, when we talked about supply and demand, we talked about like uh, a shortage or a surplus. That if my price was too high, eventually all things would happen that would move that price down and get us back to this equilibrium spot. That if the price of your good is too high, businesses will have too much of it left on the shelf, they'll have a surplus, they'll lower the price, get it back to equilibrium, right? Well, you gotta think of this happening, but for the economy as a whole. That the economy as a whole has that kind of mechanism happening as well. Where that long run aggregate supply curve isn't like a suggestion. It's where it should be. And we assume that over time, because of how markets work, that they revert to where they should be. They get back on track. It's kind of the idea. Again, technically an assumption, but we'll roll with it. So if we start off at full employment with everything going hunky-dory, everything going great, everyone having an awesome time, and our economy is doing great, which that's what this drawing is. This is like, your economy is doing awesome. Everybody's having a great time. Woo, we love it. That's what we want, that's what we want to see. Everything's going great. Well, when you have something change like we've had it change a lot, you should be like, hey, uh, let's do aggregate demand falls. For whatever reason, say, uh, there's a decrease in consumer spending because incomes fall, okay? Income starts to drop a little bit. So aggregate demand decreases. And now I'm here. On a short run problem, we would have simply stopped there. That's a bit too unspaced dotted. Is there, is there dog life there? There is not. There we go. So we have my GDP dropping. We have my price level dropping relative to where it was before, right? So aggregate demand is falling down. Short run, we stop. We're like, oh, cool, that's bad. <laughs> that's it. And we sort of like, that sucks. And then we move on. That's how the short run stuff always works. The long run self-adjustment, if you're hearing something along the lines of, and here's sort of like your code word for it, or like if we're talking about like a sleeper agent, the word or phrase that makes you go crazy, is if a question asks what happens in the long run, and if they specifically ask what happens in the long run if there is no government involvement, if the government doesn't get involved or do anything, here's what's gonna happen. It's called the long run self-adjustment. So I mentioned that wages and prices are fully flexible. So the idea is this, given enough time, the economy will self-correct. Okay, so eventually we are going to get back to a spot where all three of my lines intersect like they did up here. It doesn't have to be back here exactly, but I got to get back to a spot where all three intersect. So when I, when I hear what happens in the long run, I got to be thinking, okay, in the long run, it's got to get back to equilibrium. You then have to think how, and the how is gonna be built on this wage and price flexibility thing. The idea that, okay, given enough time, wages and prices can change. Okay, all right, cool. So I'm looking at this graph and I'm thinking, okay, what could happen to wages or prices that would allow me to produce more or at least get me back to where I'm supposed to be? Because I need to get back to a spot where all three lines intersect. And my AD is right here it means either I technically need AD to go back or I would need SRAS to shift to the right because that would get me to this spot, which would also work. So how to tell which line to move is that if they say no government involvement, the line that I'm going to move is SRAS because if the government isn't fixing the problem when it comes to a massive economic issue, we are probably going to assume that businesses will be the ones that are going to fix it. Not because consumers are like dumb, but because we act individually and not collectively a lot of the time. Like, our behavior doesn't work in such a way that we are grouped together to act the same. And it's not like businesses talk to each other like that, but when one business does things, businesses tend to follow in their stead for the sake of competition. A lot of times they have to. So if I said, hey, in this situation, price level has fallen down. Everything in the economy is getting cheaper. 
what could a business rationally do to their wages? Well, if everything's getting cheaper, they don't need to pay their workers as much, right? Because if their workers are like going out to the store and buying things, they can buy more than before. So you can actually lower their pay a little bit and they would go back to where they were at previously from like a spending power standpoint. So if they lowered wages as a business that allows them to produce more, because if they pay their workers less, they can afford more resources, pay for more workers, etc., which would get me this change on my graph. I would get SRAS increasing, which would get me, hey, look at that. Back to long run equilibrium. So let's make sure we're clear on how this part works, because this is always the thing my students struggle with. So if you're not one of my students, or you are, writing out the steps is good. First step, do the short run shift. Whatever the short run shift is in a problem, you solve for it. Okay, second step. If it's a long run self adjustment, what do I gotta do? What you're going to do is you need to get back to long run equilibrium. That is the first thought that has to go back to your head. You need to get to long run equilibrium. Second, if the government says that there is, if it says that there's no government involvement, I'm gonna be moving SRAS to get back to equilibrium. And how I'm going to do it is I'm going to, step three, adjust wages in such a way to get supply where it has to go. I need supply to increase, I should lower wages because that lets me produce more. I need supply to decrease, which would happen if I reset this whole thing and went the other way. Speed run it. Uh, would be an increase in AD, so a decrease in aggregate supply. Like that. So if I don't see it, if I see that initial shift, I'm like, oh, okay, we moved like that, now we're up here, okay, we're off of it, SRS has to shift left, so I need supply to decrease. How do I get supply to decrease? Well, if you pay your workers more, you can't produce as much. So that's the wage thing. So wages is your key to the long run self adjustment. The fact that wages can change in the long run is kind of what determines how this works. It's the, it's the only thing that lets this even happen is the fact that the long run is defined by its ability to change wages and input prices. So like, all right, input prices go up in the situation, price level went up in that initial shift. So businesses can't produce as much and supply drops, which gets us back to long run equilibrium. Stop right there, problem solved. So the long run self adjustment is initial change, got to get back to equilibrium based around the fact that supply is going to change, SRAS is, because wages can change. The last thing I'll mention here is that like, I did move SRAS in the long run. Like the question would have stated what happens in the long run and my answer would have been SRAS moves to get back to equilibrium. A lot of students struggle with that, namely because of verbiage where it's like, I asked what happens in the long run. I moved to the line called the short run. That sounds really stupid. Don't think of the names of the lines as telling you really anything. The long aggregate supply curve is best thought of as our ideal amount of production. SRAS is our current ability to produce. So when I change wages, that doesn't change my ideal level of production because the wages wouldn't matter for my ideal level of production. Right, that it is whatever it is based on how much resources I have, not how much they cost. But if the cost changes, that does change my present ability to make things. So if I pay my workers more, I can't produce as much. So when I'm changing things like wages, I'm affecting the SRAS, not the LRAS, because the fact that this line is vertical tells me that prices don't matter. Prices are low, cool, I'm here. Prices are high, cool, I'm here. They don't care that line doesn't matter. Prices don't care matter for that line. So that's as short of a review as I can do the long run self adjustment, even though I did have to basically explain the whole thing again. So if you need more help on that, I got a whole video where it's like 45 minutes of me going through the whole thing. So feel free to grab that. All right, last bit of review from a content standpoint, fiscal policy. This is relatively easy, I think. So let's see if I can nail this really well. Fiscal policy. I'm gonna make myself bigger because I don't even need to draw anything for this. Fiscal policy are actions taken by the government that are meant to stabilize the economy. They're trying to get full employment to happen. So they're trying to like get to full employment there. 
they are trying to reduce inflation and reduce unemployment. They're trying to do the good things, right? The government's ultimate goal from an economic standpoint is to help the economy. And fiscal policy is a tool they can use to try and help it. Now, for like to cross over with your U.S. government class and your AP government class, uh, in America, fiscal policy is controlled by Congress, the legislative branch. It varies from country to country on who actually controls fiscal policy, but for America, it would be Congress. And the main fiscal policies that you guys would be aware of are the Congress's powers to tax and spend. The fact that Congress can change the budget and approve more or less funding for spending, like, hey, the government wants to allocate more funds for the military or take away money from health care, like that is a fiscal policy. It is a policy that is going to have a direct economic impact on us. Okay, those are fiscal policies. They're handled by Congress in the United States. Again, it's technically the government in general, but for America, it's Congress for the most part. There are multiple types you got to be aware of. The first like way it's broken down is discretionary versus non-discretionary. That isn't the biggest way to focus, but let's start with there. A discretionary fiscal policy is a fiscal policy that the government actually has to actively enact. That was an accidental acronym. Oh my God, I'm doing more acronym. Okay, uh, or alliteration, not acronym. All right, sorry. Uh, so discretionary means they have to actually try to do it. That means Congress has to like pass a bill into law. If you need like, what, what do I mean by that? Like, they actually have to pass a bill. So most changes to taxing and spending are discretionary because like they want to do a new budget, they got to approve a new budget, meaning they have to put it in a bill, sign it into law. They want to change taxes, cool, new bill, sign into law. That's discretionary. They have to choose to do it. Non-discretionary policies, which are also called automatic stabilizers, that's what they're mostly referred to as, are previously enacted policies, policies that have already been passed, that are put into play a while ago, that through how they work, act as an automatic stabilizer. Meaning when things start to go bad for our economy, they help out a little bit. When we start to have a bunch of inflation, they slow us down a little bit. And a couple of examples of that, one that I use is like welfare, where like when you start to have a recession hit, more people qualify for where welfare and unemployment benefits. So even though my economy is starting to like dip down from a GDP standpoint, the people that are getting welfare and unemployment benefits now have more money to spend. So it's starting to pick up, pick right back up. It's meant to like without government even having to pass a new law, it is automatically kind of balancing itself out. There's a handful of things that work for this. I use welfare as the most obvious example, but there are things like how our taxes work that do that as well, where when you are richer, you pay more in taxes. So if my GDP starts to improve and incomes rise, people start to pay more in taxes and that causes their spending to go down, which is actually good if you're causing an inflationary gap, right? Because the inflationary gap is caused by more spending and then your spending gets brought back down by that raise in taxes based on your income. So it's self-regulating in that respect. Lastly, the other two categories to know with fiscal policy are expansionary and contractionary. This is what the policy is meant to accomplish is what tells you if it's expansionary or contractionary. How the policy is enacted is discretionary or non-discretionary. So why they're doing it slash what it's meant to do. Expansionary, improve the economy from like a increased spending standpoint. Contractionary, improve the economy by slowing us down. One is the gas, one is the brake. Sometimes we're going too fast, we need to pump the brakes a little bit, that is inflationary gap, you wanna do contractionary policy. Sometimes you're going too slow and you need to speed up, that is expansionary policy. So let me use the graph to explain that. So let's say our economy is, and this is kind of a review, based off what I was talking about earlier. Let's say our economy is going through this right now. I've got my LRAS over here, I've got my SRAS over here, and I got my AD down here. All right, it's real GDP as my x-axis. You can try to make it so you can see it. I know my camera's kind of in the way. And price level. All right, currently this economy is in a, check your notes, look at it real quickly. My current level protection is right here. Currently, this economy would be in a recessionary gap or a negative output gap. We are currently not producing enough. We should be here. We are here. That is bad. So, oh, didn't mean to zoom in. All right. Okay, that'll work. Yeah, that'll work. 
So if I'm the government and I see this is happening, what might I do? Well, I can try and let the automatic stabilizers take care of it, which is, okay, welfare should be trickling out. People should be getting paid more unemployment benefits because more people are unemployed. So that should improve spending a little bit, increase AD, maybe get me back there. But most of the time, automatic stabilizers don't do enough because otherwise the government wouldn't have to do anything at any time, which would be crazy because they love to have to do things. So if I'm the government and I see that we're in a recession, I need our economy to do what? I need them to expand. I need to grow. I need us to get better. So an example of a discretionary, expansionary fiscal policy, it's a lot of words, would be increasing government spending or decreasing taxes. Again, I mentioned that the fiscal policies for us are built around the ideas that the government has the power to tax and spend. So focus around that. If the government were to increase its spending, that would increase aggregate demand. Hello. Oh, look, we're back at equilibrium. Gotta love it. That's what you want. Or if they lowered taxes, would also increase spending and bang, boom, that is also what we want. So sick. Gotta freaking love it. That's what we want to see. So if the government is getting involved, which is this is the other type of long run problem to be aware of, is that you see a situation where the long aggregate supply is not where it's supposed to be. Like, uh oh, it's over here. What do we do? If the government is doing something, chances are it's going to be an aggregate demand shift because government has a lot of control over that. Change in taxes, change in spending. If they do monetary policy, which we'll get to in the next set of videos, it'll change aggregate demand. It'll change our overall spending levels in the economy. If the government doesn't do it, if the government doesn't solve it, if they give you this exact same scenario and say, okay, government ain't doing jack, what's going to happen? That is the long run self-adjustment. Meaning, all right, government can't fix it. That means business has got to fix it. Businesses really control that. And it's going to be because of wages that it happens. So what would they need to do to wages to have this work? They need this shift because that's where SRAS could go. That would get me back to equilibrium. So if they need supply to go up, they would need wages to go down. If the businesses pay their workers less, they can hire more workers, improve their productivity, get back to equilibrium. That means that this part of the course, at least this long run self-adjustment thing, the thing in the middle there, is very much an assumption. It is very much a, you kind of just have to follow this rule and accept it which is that we're not at equilibrium, we gotta get back, wages gotta change to get us there, which will change SRS to move us there. Every time, yes, every time. Before you ask me, yes, every time. Every time, every time, every time, every time. Which is nice, because it means you get to rinse, lather, and repeat the same answer a lot of the time, which is that wages change, we get back to full employment, eh, a lot. Okay, uh, I can do one more before I show us the question. Oh, whoa, that's not what I wanted. Okay. Let's just use the eraser now. Good. I mean, you can tell that's AD, but I'll put the A over here. We're at full employment at the start here. Love that. Everything's going great. Uh, we have a... The federal government lowers the minimum wage is our scenario. That tends to affect our ability to produce things more. Wages are more of a factor for production than they are for consumption. So aggregate supply would go up in the short run. We're doing the short run change first. They, I lowered the minimum wage. Businesses, because of that, will be able to hire more people and improve their production. That is my short run change. Okay, say the government wants to try and fix the economic situation created by that shift, which is I am no longer here at full employment. I am now there where my GDP is ahead of where I'm supposed to be. So I'm in an inflationary gap. And this is why they call it a positive output gap a lot of the time now on the AP exam, because inflation didn't actually happen here. Like price level went down. So calling an inflationary gap is a misnomer sometimes. So a positive output gap is created. All right, if the government wants to get us back to full employment, what they would probably do is get a D to decrease because that's what they control a lot of the time. 
So it would be that if the government was going to fix it. This is if the government pursues a fiscal policy like raising taxes would get me down there or cutting government spending would get me down there. Those would work. So again, if the government's involved, I'm going to be changing aggregate demand. Things like government spending and taxes affect aggregate demand. And if the question were to say, what would happen in the long run, assuming no government involvement, good, you can see Archer thinking about which couch he wants to sit on in the background right now. He's trying to determine where he wants to sit and lay down. Let's see what he does. He's sitting. He's just going to sit right there. That's great. So we're asking, what happens if the government doesn't do anything here? Again, if business is going to fix it, how are they going to fix it? They're going to move supply to get back to equilibrium. Where do I got to move supply to get back to equilibrium? Literally back. I am literally undoing the original shift. We move from there to there. And because businesses are fixing it, they're changing the supply curve. So they're moving back from there to there. How? I need supply to decrease. They lowered the minimum wage. This is going to sound real stupid. They pay their workers more in the long run. In the long run, they'd be like, okay, that was stupid. We should be chiller. Let's pay our workers more. We didn't need to lower their wages. Everything was going fine before. Let's just, let's, let's, let's not. Let's pay them more and get back to equilibrium. This will feel stupid sometimes. It will feel stupid sometimes during the long run self-adjustment. Again, it's an assumption. It's a thing that we are assuming happens. It gets easier to understand as you get later in the course when you can see it happen on other graphs. But for the time being, as long as you're in this part of the class still, you're going to be thinking a lot of the times like, why? It's just because it has to. That's honest to God, the why. All right. Now it's practice time. Let's go through some practice problems. Make it huge. Let's see what happens. All right. I got a graph. Oh, look, there's three different aggregate bankers, point X, point Y, and point Z. Given the graph, SRS and LRS, which of the following is true? At point Z, this economy has cyclical unemployment. Vocab time. Cyclical unemployment is unemployment caused by a recession. At point Z, they are in a positive output gap, a.k.a. inflationary gap. They're not in a recession. So A is wrong. B, at point Z, the economy is in long run, but not short run equilibrium. They're at short run equilibrium at point Z because they're at the intersection. They are not at long run equilibrium because all three lines don't intersect there. So that's wrong. C, at point Y, the natural rate of unemployment is zero. That means the ideal amount of unemployment is zero at Y. That isn't true. Uh, one, because our natural rate of unemployment is basically never zero. And two, point Y doesn't tell me what the natural rate of unemployment is. It just tells me they're at the natural rate of unemployment. Because if you're at the natural rate of unemployment, you're at full employment, right? It's because against ideal unemployment. So if I'm... If my natural rate of unemployment is 4% and my current amount of unemployment is 4%, my economy is crushing it. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be. I'd be at point Y. At point X, the economy is experiencing a recessionary gap. Yes. Flat out, yes. That is just true and accurate and correct. At point X, there is no frictional. I don't know how I would know that off of this. I wouldn't. So it was D. Number two. In the long run, if aggregate demand decreases, real GDP and price level will change in which the following ways. I forgot to open the pen thing again. How can this happen every single time I do a video? I've been doing these videos for a while now, and I still forget to pull up the pen thing every freaking time, man. Oh, I didn't want to open that time. Uh-oh. Uh, uh, okay, doesn't want to open. I'm going to drop myself. Fine. Computer, keep your secrets. Oh, wait, no, there it is. It's hidden on the side of the screen. Wow, that was really off, off to the side for me. So I'm going to draw it right over all the words. Okay. In the long run, if aggregate demand decreases, real GDP and price level will change in which of the following ways. Okay. It didn't tell me the government's involved, so I have to assume that they're not, just in case you didn't know. If they don't tell you, then you got to assume the government's not involved. They said the aggregate demand decreases. Okay. And then if the government's not involved, what happens in the long run? This is the business has got to fix it. SRAS is going to increase to get back to equilibrium. So I'm going to end up down there. So in the long run, I started up here and I ended down there. So my price level for sure fell. It fell by a lot. But my GDP did not look like it changed. So it would be price level decrease, real GDP, no change. That is answer choice C on that question. 
What you got to be aware of is that in the long run, if you started off at full employment, then whenever you get back to full employment in the long run, that means your GDP ultimately didn't change. Like you started off where they all intersect and then you ended up where they all intersect again, which is at the exact same X value. So real GDP in the long run shouldn't change because you should always end up at the same spot. Price level can though, because price level could be higher or lower. It's a vertical line, price level could go up or down. Three, which of the following would indicate that economic growth has occurred? Now this is technically a unit five or six topic actually, but it's illustrated by our graph. So let's look at it. PPC shifts left. No, that's decrease in production. That's not good. LRAS shifts right. We'll get to that. Aggregate demand shifts right. We'll get to that. Phillips curve becomes flatter. Business cycles no longer exist, which means there are no more ups or downs in the economy. That's super not it. So it ain't D or E or A. A and B. What does B represent? What is B telling me? The LRAS is our ideal level of production. It's our best case scenario. It is if our economy is doing great, here's what we will be producing. So if that line moves to the right, if the LRAS shifts to the right, that means that our ideal level of production is now higher. How would that happen? If we had a bunch more resources, that's about it, which would mean our economy is growing. The problem with C is that C is temporary. That if your aggregate demand shifts to the right, and in the long run, the economy always self-corrects, I mentioned in the last question, it means GDP doesn't really change in the long run which means the economic growth can't occur that way. But if my LRAS moves to the right and my economy is always going to move to where that is, that means the economy is actually growing. Because if it always went back, then it would never progress. But if it always goes back and the vertical line moves to the right, then my GDP is actually getting higher over time. All right, in the graph above, AD denotes the aggregate demand curve, SRAS the short run rate supply, LRAS the long run rate supply, yep. If no policy actions were taken, which of the following would move the economy to its long run equilibrium? So there are no policy actions taking place, meaning no government. So which line's gotta go where? Once again, every time, I said every time, aggregate supply will shift to the left. Now none of these say that, which is annoying. But I mentioned, how do we get supply to change? Wages, which there's two wages ones. There's two wages, one increase or decrease in wages. I had to have supply decrease here, so I would need wages to be increasing. Because if I pay my workers more, I can't produce as much as a business. I'll have to lay off some workers or I won't be able to pay for as many of my other resources if I'm paying my workers more in a vacuum. So pay them more, okay, I can't produce as much, which is actually what you want here. You, you want businesses to be producing less because that gets you back to my equilibrium. Okay, five. If the government implements an expansionary fiscal policy, how would real GDP and price level be affected in the short run? You gotta always be looking for those kind of things. I can draw this in a space between here. I don't need a long aggregate supply curve because it just so happens in the short run. So an expansionary fiscal policy, which is a fiscal policy designed to help our economy improve would be something along the lines of lowering income taxes or increasing government spending. Those are your two fundamental expansionary fiscal policies. Both of those increase aggregate demand. Again, the government has a lot of control over aggregate demand. So if they're saying the government's really doing kind of anything on this graph, it's probably gonna change aggregate demand. Let's say literally say like the government makes it so businesses can produce more, which would be like, oh, I mean, sure, aggregate supply would change there. If they're telling the aggregate demand government's really doing pretty much anything, it's probably changing aggregate demand. So I need a, a higher aggregate demand would be that I have a higher level of real GDP and a higher price level. Gosh, my nose is messing with me right now. Let me blow my nose real quick. Apologies, camera. Apologies, Mike. Oh, I can breathe. All right. So real GDP should go up. Price level should also go up. Got it. Next. Six. If the economy experiences a sharp increase in energy prices, okay, and policymakers, the government, adopt a stabilization policy to increase aggregate demand. 
Oh, Mo- Mona. Okay, so I'm gonna read. I'm gonna go through Mona's question before I answer this one because I just got to it. Mona asked in the chat on question three: If LRAS moves to the right, we would be in a recession. So how does that show that economic growth has occurred? Okay, so this is a classic thing that is hard to get a lot of the time. I know what you're thinking, which is like, if we were here and I move this line here, then now I'm still here and every and now I'm in a recession. So here's the problem. Here's the thing that you gotta understand. When I'm drawing something like this as my recession, it's not that my vertical line moved to the right. Everything else was left. So whenever I'm seeing this visual, I didn't start off at full employment and have LRAS move to the right. I started at full employment and SRAS or AD went left if I'm in a recession. So when it's saying that the LRAS is shifting to the right, what they mean is my anchor is shifting to the right, which will look like, and that's why you don't usually draw it because it gets really confusing if you start to draw it. But I'm moving that LRAS to the right, which means in the long run, since the economy is self-correcting, everything else will catch up to it. That since that anchor point is higher, my economic growth will improve. Typically speaking, Mona, a way to think about it is whatever causes LRAS to shift almost always causes SRAS to shift too. Like LRAS shifting is built around the idea that my ideal level of production goes up. There isn't really a way for my ideal level of production to go up that wouldn't also cause my current level of production to go up, right? Because that's built around stuff like capital stock and way better technology and way higher quality of workers, right? Like if those things happen, yes, my full employment level would go up. Also, my current level of production would go up. So that wouldn't just move LRAS to the right. I'm going to make it real big so we can make it easier to understand. Oh, I made that so terrible. Let me erase that line. And draw that through there so if I started off here and I said hey we've got way more capital than before my LRS would shift there my SRAS would also shift there so now I go from this point to that point which means my current level of production was this my current level my next level of production is that and is going to like stick around there and not just go back to where it was before. It'll actually like lock in there because the LRAS moved. If the LRAS didn't move, then it would just always revert back to equilibrium. So LRAS moving is like sort of pulling my entire economy along because the anchor point, the spot that we always adjust to is now further ahead, which would only happen if your economy actually grew as opposed to like everything else is just like temporary. If LRAS stays the same and stuff improves, it's just going to revert back. So that's not economic growth because that's temporary. But if LRAS moves, then it's permanent. Because you're going to adjust to that spot now and catch up to that, which is going to drag your economy forward. But again, typically when LRAS moves, it also moves the other stuff. It's not, it doesn't move on its own, typically. And I hope that helps. It is super confusing. And we'll get into this a little bit more when we do unit five or six whichever one hits economic growth because that is a topic in one of those a way to imagine it is like the production possibilities curve shifting outward is the exact same as the lras shifting rightward okay i hope that helped mona i have no idea if it did it's a hard thing to get and i'm not the best at explaining everything in the class okay so back to six an economy experiences a sharp increase in energy prices and policymakers adopt a stabilization policy to increase aggregate demand. I like that they're telling me what's going to happen. That makes me feel good. Compared with the initial short run equilibrium, which the following will definitely occur. Okay. Ah, oh, that's, too, that's too far. I need to move that more this way. Here we go. So we got initial. It doesn't technically say long run aggregate supply, but it says a stabilization policy. So I'm going to assume long run aggregate supply was in the middle it'll actually help me with it too so I started off full employment equilibrium which I'm only saying that I'm starting off there because I kind of know what this statement is going to tell me to do so if I'm looking at this it tells me that there's a sharp increase in energy prices energy prices is a supply shifter because it factors into your cost of production if I'm a business paying more for my energy 
means I cannot produce as much of my goods. So supply drops. And then they said that the government is going to increase aggregate demand. I know it's a stabilization policy, so I know it should get me back to full employment, which is why I knew to draw to full employment because they're trying to stabilize stuff and there was a thing that happened before, so they were probably at full employment and then that thing moved them off of it. It's technically a guess, but educated guess. And you don't actually need the LRAS here to do this problem. You just need to do the first shift and then the second shift. Okay, compared to before, what's happening? Do I have a higher or lower level of output? It looks like my level of output stayed the same. Technically, it's indeterminate. So I don't know what happens to it. But compared to where I started, where I finished, looks like it's the same. My price level, though, for sure higher. I don't have a higher aggregate supply. I actually have a lower aggregate supply. My price level is most definitely bigger, though. Because we had pr energy prices go up. That should increase price level. And then we have more spending, which should make prices go up even more than before. It's higher price level. Okay, six. This is the automatic stabilizer question. Recessions will be less severe if tax revenues and transfer payments, like welfare, it's when government transfers money to you, it's so like welfare or unemployment, automatically change which the following ways. Okay, so this needs to make a recession less severe, so this needs to help people spend. Tax revenue... Well, if I'm the people, I would like the government to be making less in taxes for me to spend more. So I would need tax revenue to go down. And if I'm the people, if I want to be spending more, I would need transfer payments to go up because that'd be like, again, like more welfare, more unemployment benefits that gets us to spend more. So I would need lower taxes and higher transfer payments. These technically both happen automatically whenever a recession occurs. This question just didn't mention that, but they do both happen. Because when recessions occur, whenever people start to lose their jobs, guess who can't pay taxes? The unemployed. So whenever you lose your jobs, those tax revenues do drop, which does technically allow people to spend more because they're, they are being taxed less. Like that part of the equation has gone away. That like thing that was inhibiting you is lessened now. And transfer payments increase because whenever recessions happen, there being more unemployed people allows for more unemployment checks to go and more welfare to be given out to people. So that is tech technically this is automatic stabilizers that they're talking about. But these things are both helping automatically deal with this recession. All right. And lastly, an FRQ. I hate these. These are so stupid sometimes. All right. Well, because the names are terrible. Names are real bad. All right. The economy of money land. freaking college board okay has an actual unemployment rate that is less than the natural unemployment rate Ooh, okay so what does that mean let's translate that their current level of unemployment is less than the natural rate of unemployment less makes it sound bad but they're saying that there's less unemployment than there is supposed to be okay so how do i graph that because they're telling me to graph aggregate demand aggregate supply long run aggregate supply they want the full graph here I'm gonna do this one on my whiteboard because I don't want to cover up all the words on this thing, even though my camera is covering up a good amount of it. So it tells me that my current unemployment rate is less than my actual rate of unemployment. So as a heads up, when I'm starting these graphs, I always do draw this first. I always draw this X first, and then I draw LRAS later. So it tells me my current level of unemployment is less than the natural rate. The natural rate is the ideal amount. We have less unemployment than ideal. Well, really low unemployment doesn't sound like a recession to me, right? Recessions are when you have too much unemployment. If anything here, I have too little, which would mean that I'm not in a recessionary gap. I am in an inflationary gap. Because if my unemployment level is lower than what it's supposed to be, then I am ahead of full employment. There is that drawing. That's a good looking drawing. So yeah, my current level production, YE, which I should actually say current level, but they said here to label as Y1, which I'll fix that. There we go. Oh, and PL1. Sorry, question. You told me what to label it. I should have labeled it that way. There we go. Y1 and PL1 are my current output and my current price level. 
and then YF is my full employment level up. But basically, I have too many people working, which doesn't sound terrible, and it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not ideal either, because there are some people who shouldn't be working, like people who want to move for, for, from a place to a place and end up being unemployed for a period of time. They shouldn't be working in a situation, or people whose jobs should have kind of gotten replaced by machines and stuff like that. Even though it sounds not fun to have your job replaced by a machine, some jobs machines can replace and do at a lower cost and do just as well, if not better. So economically speaking, those jobs should go away. So we start there. That's all for A. That's a lot of stuff for A. That's like three different points for A, I bet. B, suppose that investment spending on plant and equipment increases. On plant? That sounds weird. Plant... I don't like that they phrase that. It says to show the effect of the increase in investment spending. Yeah, I can read myself now. On the equilibrium price level and real output in the short run. All right. So there's an increase in this stuff. This kind of spending is going up. There's more investment spending. All right. Well, that increases aggregate demand, which the question did not tell me that, but investment spending is a type of spending. <laughs> by businesses, typically on things that help them produce more like equipment, implant stuff. So that should theoretically increase my aggregate demand. Uh, and then give me, it says to show the effect on the price level and the uh, real GDP. So I need to label stuff. Got an increase in aggregate demand here. Here we go. Uh, I got Y2, that's my new GDP, and PL2, that's my new price level. To be clear, this question is messing with you on the long run self adjustment thing. Because B here does not get you back to full employment. It's not supposed to. B is not saying what happens in the long run. It is saying, hey, this thing happens. Draw it. It's not, it says in the short run even. So this can totally, this is totally fine. It's just weird to see because you're like, oh wow, they moved it further away from full employment. That's not good. It's like, no, it is not. You are right to think that. All right. C, identify one fiscal policy action the government of Moneyland can use to restore full employment. Okay, they are in an inflationary gap. They are in a positive output gap by a freaking lot now. Like, boy, they were already in one, and now they're in an even bigger one. So they're going to need one hell of a contractionary monetary policy, a fiscal policy to have this happen. They need, to, they need the economy to slow the hell down. People are spending too much, which sounds great, but it's going to cause prices to go to a really bad spot. Because the more you spend, the more businesses can charge, and uh, we don't want that. So what a fiscal, what's a fiscal policy they can do? I can't just say contractionary. That's a type of fiscal policy that is not a fiscal policy. A fiscal policy action is an actual literal thing they would do, like lowering government spending or raising taxes. Either of those would work. Again, you're, when it's fiscal policy, you're always thinking government spending and taxes. Those are the two fiscal policies you got to have ready to go. So if I need my economy to slow down, I would want the government to be spending less or I'd want them to be taxing more because either one of those will reduce overall spending levels. It doesn't say to graph, it just asks me to indicate it. So I would say, okay, the government should raise income taxes or the government should lower government spending. That would work. That would be the answer there. What would happen graphically if I were to draw that is aggregate demand would decrease. If it's wanting me to get back to full employment, it would decrease all the way back to here. So like, it would be like there would be my new aggregate demand curve, like right intercepting at that spot. It would decrease a ton. It would have to for it to work like that. Don't have to draw that though. And then D, also don't have to draw this, but I'm gonna wanna think with the drawing. Assume that instead the government of Moneyland does not decide, decides not to take any policy action. The government isn't doing anything. Will the short run aggregate supply, okay, increase, decrease, or stay the same in the long run? And explain. They are asking you what happens in the long run. They're helping you by narrowing it down. By asking you, hey, what happens in the long run to SRAS? Remember, if the government isn't involved, which it's saying that the government is deciding to not take any policy action, that means that SRAS has to move and it has to move to get us back to equilibrium. So if I'm here and that's my supply curve. Oh, sorry, there it is. That's my supply curve. I was mirroring really badly. That's my supply curve. I need that line to move 
back to get me to full employment. They're not making me draw it because that graph would get very busy, but I would need my SRAS to decrease. So SRAS will need to decrease. That's the first part of it. It says to explain it. Here's the explanation. Because in the long run, the economy is self-correcting, SRAS will need to decrease to get back to full employment, period. This will happen due to businesses in the long run raising wages as a result of the inflationary gap, which makes sense to do, by the way. You don't have to say this part, but like it makes sense for businesses to start paying their workers more eventually because inflation's happening, right? This is an inflationary gap. They should pay their workers more. It would make sense. It's nice, right? So they're paying their workers more due to the inflationary gap, which will mean that the business will not be able to afford the same amount of resources as before, thereby decreasing SRAS because they will not be able to produce the same amount of stuff. So let me say the explanation again. Because in the long run, the economy is self-adjusting, SRAS will need to decrease. That is not the full explanation. That is just my starting point, period. These explanations for long run stuff take a while. The full explanation, the second part of that. Businesses will raise wages to compensate workers for the inflationary gap. In doing so, that will hurt their overall ability to produce things because they will not be able to afford as many resources or workers, which will decrease short run aggregate supply solved that amount of writing is probably something along the lines of like four maybe five lines of text on a notebook paper slash frq paper that's about the longest explanation you're going to have to ever give in this class most of them are about three lines of text if we're being honest uh, a long run self-adjustment thing because you have to kind of explain what's happening the whole way down uh, takes probably about five lines on average i bet to fully explain it and cover all of your bases and actually say why it's happening which is the economy is self-correcting and not or and businesses will have to change wages in such a way to get back to full employment and you have to tell them like which way they would change and why that would get them back to full employment so in this case it would be they would be raising wages because of the inflationary gap and if they raise wages they won't be able to afford as many resources whether that be their other inputs or workers which will reduce their ability to produce things reduce their ability to produce things I'm actually glad I only picked one FRQ because that took a while. Because <laughs> that explanation is a lot, and that is kind of a lot of a problem. Now, this is technically a short FRQ, which is kind of scary to say, because you would have 15 minutes to solve it. Now, I solved through it and explained every single part of it in about 13 minutes. And that's me taking my sweet time. I could have done that faster, but I wanted to make sure that you understood everything along the way. Now, if you're watching this video later and you have questions as I go through it, like Mona had a great question in the chat, over question three, if any of you have questions as you're going through it, which you're allowed to, I went through a lot of stuff very quickly, feel free to type them in the comments. I'll be able to get to them later. So if you're watching this like two days before the AP exam, panic studying, and you're like, oh, sweet God, I didn't get any of like number four or five. I have no idea how that worked. Type it in the comment section of the video. I'll be able to get to it. I'll see it. I get alerted every time someone comments on a video of mine, which is great for when the spam bots comment on my videos. Uh, and I can come in and respond to that comment and post a reply and you'll be able to see that I replied to it and all that stuff. So feel free to absolutely do that. I'm going to help you best I can understand as much of this stuff as possible because this stuff is very hard. So all that being said, that is just about it for the long aggregate supply curve stuff, the self-adjustment process and fiscal policy. If you're watching this video as a review and you're like, man, I still need more on the LRAS stuff. Feel free to go back and watch my full lecture video on LRAS. That's not a bad idea. And look forward to future videos where I go through more practice problems. Because once we get to the week before the AP exam, I'm going in full scale, like big picture review mode where I'm going to hit on questions that cover things from multiple units, including this. Fiscal policy comes up in a lot of different units. Uh, the long run self-adjustment can get thrown onto just about any FRQ when they say like, hey, what if that didn't happen? Uh -huh. They do that a lot. So that stuff's gonna come up again with the economic growth stuff in unit five and six. It'll come up again. So you'll have more opportunities to look at questions over it. But please, 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 if you got questions, leave them in the comments below. Thank you guys for watching. As always, uh, like, comment, subscribe. I don't really care if you do that or not. I'm not trying to monetize this thing at all, but if you want to go for it, it is appreciated. It's just not necessary. Uh, and that's about it. The next video series, the next video in this, which will be on Tuesday, will be over the beginning part of unit four. 
monetary policy and the money market graph. Actually, wait, no, it would be money. Oh man, I will knock that off. No, I'm gonna make sure I do this in the right order. The first part of unit four for me is money, financial assets, and bank balance sheets. The graph stuff is the next video. Okay, Whew. almost messed that up. Wanna make sure I didn't get that wrong. So yeah, unit four, first part next week will be the math part of unit four, which is the money multiplier effect, doing a bank balance sheet, stuff like that. A thing that students forget how to do very quickly. Uh, and then the second part of it next Thursday, so a week from today, will be the unit four graphs, which are the money market and loanable funds market graph, as well as monetary policy. So that was the next set of videos. Again, thank you guys for watching. Wish you all the best of luck going forward. Again, if you need questions, leave them in the comments as best I can. I will get to them as soon as I can. Thank you all for watching it and have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it.